statement. Uh, we had anticipated from the original timings that this would be a little bit later in the day and therefore were slightly caught unawares, which meant that we, we missed the, the deadline. Uh, I suppose I'm around this place long enough to know that the timings will alter, so I humbly apologise to the House and all members um, for uh, missing uh, that particular timescale. Should I also say at this stage, also add an apology, the original intention had also been that prior to the statement that I'd arranged to brief the chair and vice chair ahead of that. Obviously, because of the collapse in terms of timing, that was not possible, but I would like to place on the record to the chair and the vice chair that subsequent to the statements today, uh, that myself and officials will certainly be available to discuss over any elements of, of detail which are not drawn out from the um, not drawn out from the, the statement or the questions that themselves, and I'll be happy to meet with them after these statements. Thank the Minister for uh, that, and it's now on the record. And I call the Minister for Education, Mr. Peter Weir, to make a statement. Minister. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I welcome the opportunity to make a statement to the Assembly. Today I am announcing a further package of comprehensive measures which I believe will ensure fair, inclusive and flexible public examinations in 2021. As I have said on a number of occasions, exams will go ahead but will be underpinned by contingencies for all scenarios. However, it is not business as usual. I know our students are facing unprecedented disruption to their learning. That is why our qualifications will be different next year and why I will be taking exceptional steps to ensure that they are as fair as possible. Over the past few weeks, my officials have been working closely with CCEA to develop wide-ranging measures which will best support students in these unprecedented times. In doing so, they have engaged with the Education and Training Inspectorate, school leaders, teachers and, very importantly, young people to seek their views on the way forward. I believe the changes I am announcing will provide young people with the clarity and confidence they need to achieve success. These changes include more generous grading across all qualifications, as well as significant reductions in the content uh, which will be assessed compared with normal. I am very conscious that our young people have faced incredible challenges as a result of this pandemic, and in making these far-reaching adaptations, we will ensure that their lives are not defined or held back by the disruption they have experienced in 2020. I want to start by publicly thanking each and every teacher, school leader, governor and all the other vital support staff who work in and around our schools for their incredible efforts. They have dealt with a wide range of difficult and exceptional issues. Thanks to these efforts, our children have been able to return to school and continue their education. In particular, I want to pay tribute to the work of the many dedicated teachers who continue to go above and beyond to give every pupil, uh, whether in school or at home, a high-quality education. I recognise this is a difficult period for young people. Many of them have been personally impacted by the pandemic, and they are particularly concerned about how there can be fairness in the examination process. I trust the changes that I am announcing uh, today will go some considerable way to reassure those young people that we will continue to support them and help them to succeed. I will begin by reiterating that I will not be cancelling examinations. I have been clear about this over the past number of months and my position has not changed. Indeed, with the COVID vaccine being rolled out across the country, I am confident that examinations will be delivered in summer 2021. The recent November series went extremely well and has heralded a successful return to public examinations. I have heard the calls for some for me to cancel examinations. Those voices have been loud and clear. But I have also heard quieter voices of those who are equally anxious that exams should go ahead and have urged me to stand firm on this. Whilst some have called for centre assessed grades, and I entirely understand their position, I have equally heard from many who feel that cancelling exams will put school leaders and teachers under terrible pressure, putting schools at risk of numerous appeals and litigation. I have also heard from many young people in recent days who want exams to go ahead. Just last week, my officials met with groups of sixth formers across a range of different school types, both in terms of the sectors and selective and non-selective schools, and many were not in favour of replacing exams with centre assessments. They expressed concern about objectivity and fairness and wanted the opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge and skills through the examination process. I am also conscious that our, our focus needs to be on the well-being of our children and young people. Cancelling exams would lead to further months of continuous testing, 
adding to uh, the stress and anxiety experienced by pupils, uh, in effect, would be the worst of all worlds, a point that was very well articulated by the sixth formers. Some other jurisdictions uh, in purporting to avoid exams are instead running them by the back door. In Wales, young people will face extremely uh, set assessment, sorry, externally set assessments, and they will be taken earlier than usual. The harsh reality is that there's no alternative uh, to assessments or examinations in one form or another. The education system in 2021 must ensure that the cycle of overtesting is broken. And I know that I have got uh, numerous uh, concerns that have been raised in terms of what is happening on the ground as regards pupils. Overtesting is not healthy and it's not in the interest of those pupils. That time could be better spent concentrating on teaching the specification and preparing them for progression to the next stage of their education. With exams, pupils know that they will be assessed, the form and timing of that assessment, and we will be able to focus their learning for re revision and progression. As Education Minister, it's my job to weigh up these differing views, consider all the evidence and make a decision that I think is in the best interest of all the young people in our schools. It would be easy sometimes to make a seemingly populist decision, but being in government is about making the right decision in the interest of all. So while on the face of it, simply cancelling exams would seem like a good approach as we sit here today, I do not believe it is right in the longer term approach for our young people. The best way to ensure fairness and comparable standards across all schools is to have a common assessment tool that is applied under the same conditions in every school and marked externally to ensure uh, fairness. I genuinely believe that the experience of summer 2020 has shown us that exams remain the fairest method of assessing and awarding qualifications. We saw that right across the UK, indeed much in Western Europe, that despite every effort and good intention, other forms of assessment are likely to be more inequitable. Cancelling exams would undoubtedly lead to different sorts of anxieties for young people and would put incredible additional pressures on schools. Therefore, I believe it's in the best interest of pupils in schools that public examinations go ahead. Exams are the best way of giving young people the opportunity to, want to show what they can do. That is why I think it's so important they take place uh, next summer. I want to turn to standards. And first of all, I want to reassure all of our young people that we will take a generous approach to grading similar to that recently announced in England. These are extraordinary circumstances in which you have, uh, which you have to complete your qualifications. In recognition this cohort has faced and is facing, I've decided that grading will carry forward the overall generosity and standards of 2020. That will ensure the 2021 cohort are treated fairly relative to their 2020 peers. Students will be awarded more generous grades in line with last summer's significantly improved results. Schools can be confident that my department SIA have the tools to make summer 2021 exams fair and that young people in Northern Ireland will not be disadvantaged. The aim should be to achieve a level playing field for all candidates right across the UK. I've also agreed that the collection and publication of school level outcomes through the summary of annual examination results should be suspended for a further year in recognition of the significant disruption experienced by schools. Uh, 2021 examination uh, outcomes will not be used for accountability purposes. I want our school leaders and teachers to feel supported and confident as they prepare young people for public examination. Collaboration and cohesion across our system rather than competition. In October, I announced a range of changes to CCDA qualifications, making a range of public health adaptations to ensure uh, safety and delivery and reducing the number of examinations pub uh, pupils will take. I've also agreed that CCDA should delay the start of the summer exam series by one week to provide more time for preparation. In the October announcement, I said that GCSE candidates would be able to omit assessment of one unit of each of their qualifications up to a maximum of 40% of each qualification. Take as a total package, uh, this represents a very considerable reduction in the assessment burden and goes significantly further than adaptations in England where 100% of the assessment uh, of the course will be, will be assessed. In recognising, I think, the difficult public health circumstances and continued disruption, I've decided that GCSE maths in January and June 2021 will be provided with additional support materials. These support sheets will uh, relieve candidates of the burden of memorising all the information that they would normally have to. I feel they would be more prepared and more confident as a result, and this aligns with the recent announcement in England. 
Today, in terms of AS and A-levels, I'm also announcing significant changes to AS and A-level qualifications, which will sit alongside the earlier amendments to GCSEs. In recognition of the challenges of studying uh, for level three qualifications in such disrupted times, I'm taking unprecedented steps to reduce the assessment across all, all of these qualifications. Young people will have the opportunity to omit up to 60% of their AS or A2 assessment. In a significant number of subjects, this will mean taking only one unit of assessment. The key requirement that the unit or units assessed must compromise at least 40% of the AS or A2 qualification. At the centre of this reduction is choice. Our schools and colleges will choose which unit or units of assessment their pupils will take. Our young people will be assessed, uh, our young people will be assessed on topics and content in which they feel most confident and well prepared, allowing them to determine their skills uh, and knowledge to the highest possible level. In line, uh, if they so desire, with this, this emphasis on choice, candidates will be able to take all of their AS or A level units if they individually choose. I believe these changes will relieve much of the stress which our young people are experiencing. The approach will allow them to focus on key topics for a small number of examinations whilst enjoying teaching and learning in other areas of the qualifications which will not be, will not be examined. This is a flexible and unique solution designed to reflect the differing approaches and experiences to teaching and learning across schools and colleges. Whilst retaining the rigour of external assessment, which universities have told us is so important. Our universities have told us, while preferring regulated uh, external uh, assessment, they will make a sensible and pragmatic approach in these extremely difficult circumstances. The solution I presented today provides assurances to universities that the outcomes in Northern Ireland will be robust and comparable between learners, whilst recognising the need to reduce burden and safeguard the well-being and mental health of our young people. In terms of detail, I will write to schools, pupils and parents tomorrow, setting out my decision. I'm confident that the changes I'm announcing today will help all learners build their understanding and knowledge in these important qualifications. I can also say that there will be a reserve uh, series for A2 candidates who miss exams through illness or self-isolating. This will remove any doubts or uncertainties and make sure that, that every young person has the opportunity to uh, progress to education, employment or training in 2021. The reserve series will run in early July, immediately after the main A-level series. The timing of this is to ensure that results are available to the system and uh, for pupils who wish to remove into tertiary education. So the results will be for every pupil at the same time. Where a candidate uh, legitimately misses GCSE uh, exams, for example, due to illness or self-isolation, CCA is working to develop a process which facilitates the, war, the award of grades for progression. Turning to mitigation for different levels of disruption. Disruption to learning has not been uniform across the different areas of Northern Ireland, or even within schools, or even within families. Last week, my, my officials met with young people who had experienced vastly different levels of disruption some who had missed significant amounts of school and others who had missed none. Firstly, I would reassure those candidates who have been ill during the academic year that SEA's existing special consideration process uh, will continue to be available and will operate as it has done in previous years. In addition, there will need to be develop a uh, COVID-specific special circumstances for young people. So I will explore the possibility uh, of uh, COVID allowance or tariff for young people who have missed a significant number of days uh, through face-to-face -face teaching or self-isolation. This will allow for specific amounts to be taken of the variations in disrupted learning since September. Just to be clear, this will be separate from and additional to the existing special uh, consideration scheme. I have asked SIA to work closely with other awarding bodies to develop a UK-wide approach uh, to any potential scheme. It is, as with all these things, important that our students are not disadvantaged in this respect compared to their counterparts in other jurisdictions. In conclusion, I want to thank the House for the opportunity to address you on these important issues. My department is working hard to make sure that we take into account uh, the effects of the pandemic, to make the best contingency arrangements we can, 
and to make sure exam results will be fair and commend public confidence and command public confidence. Fairness of pupils is my priority and will continue to be at the forefront of every decision that is taken in the lead up to exams next summer. Exams are the fairest ways of judging students' performance, so they will go ahead underpinned by contingency measures developed in partnership with the sector. In these exceptional times, I've taken exceptional and unprecedented steps to ensure our young people are, supposed, uh, are supported to progress uh, in education, training or employment. But let me make one further commitment to our students across GCSEs, AS levels and A levels. Candidates will be awarded a grade based on their own performance in the units of assessment they have taken. Your work will determine your final marks and grades. There will not be uh, the use this year of algorithms or uh, anything which, which goes beyond that. Again, I commend all our school leaders and teachers for their efforts in these difficult times, including to all those in schools, staff, pupils and their families. At the end of what has been a very difficult year, I want to send uh, my best wishes for a quiet and restful Christmas and every success to all our students in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Education Minister's inaction and decision in U-turn caused great chaos in 2020, so I think we're entitled to uh, expect uh, more than a statement that was late in its arrival and vague in its commitments. Generous grading, reduced content, support sheets, a COVID allowance tariff uh, with a UK-wide approach without great detail for any of those commitments. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, other jurisdictions have taken decisive action to cancel or significantly modify examinations in 2021 due to the unprecedented disruption to learning. In the week commencing 12 of October, approximately 50,000 children were unable to attend school. We know some pupils are on their fourth period of self-isolation with many staff in self-isolation as well. Can I ask the Education Minister what level of COVID-related pupil absence is the Education Minister willing to accept before introducing moderated teacher and centre assess grading for 2021? Well, I, and I wish the member a very happy Christmas as well. Um, can, I, uh, can I say in response to the, some of the issues that he's raised, as regards other jurisdictions, uh, Scotland have made a, a decision that they will be using some form of um, assessment. They have not come up with the details of that. Wales is a changing flux of a position where they are introducing examinations effectively by the back door, but are still to hammer out a reasonable level of details. England have made some of the announcements, but again are to sketch out some of the details. So we need also to make sure that, that as I said, that none of our students are in any way disadvantaged compared to um, other students. He mentions in terms of the levels of absenteeism, the position is that there is always a number of pupils who will be missing at any one particular time, and that he mentions a particular week where actually those related to the COVID situation, there was 2.4% of the school population were isolated because of some level of illness, and another 5% roughly that were there uh, because of they had been um, uh, were isolating it because of contacts in that regard. That's the peak point of that. There will be other students who will be missing for a range of reasons during that. But let us also remember that those pupils as well, while it's important that the position is taken into it, we're receiving throughout that learning and remote learning. So let us not create a situation where we equate simply someone not physically being in school on a particular day with them not working hard at home. So let, let us make that fairly clear in relation to it. He mentions about the issue of mitigated uh, Centre assessed grade because anywhere where it has happened has been mitigated. But again, this creates, I think, one of the problems that would be there that was seen in 2020. It is not fair across the system. Different schools will take different approaches. Schools may well take a, a situation in which uh, they give particular grades to their pupils, knowing that it is likely they would be reduced down. And again, we would be faced with the spectacle uh, of a situation where a child a pupil may get a particular grade, will get a situation uh, in which uh, on that grade, that grade differs from what their school gave them, generally speaking would be lower than what their school gave them, and I think that that would create a level of, of conflict as well. But it is, it is also the case um, 
that in terms of to reach that grade, and this is one of the dangers that potentially could happen within the system, that you will have six months of continuous assessment, where a pupil will feel themselves to be under the microscope every day. Schools will not, you know, there is no route out which says there will not be examinations, because the alternative will be a range of examinations, put possibly on a weekly basis by schools, because schools will also feel concerned that potentially a disgruntled parent may try to sue them, for example. So we need something which is recognised clearly, which is the support of the universities, but is also fair to students. I appreciate in current circumstances getting something which is fair across the board is a very difficult thing to achieve, because you make a move in one direction, it is maybe fair for some and less fair for others. But I think the mitigations that I put forward go further than what is there in England. It avoids, quite frankly, the confusion that is out there in Wales, because they will have external examinations. They will not just call them external examinations, or the level of uncertainty that is going to happen in Scotland, which in any event has its completely different examination system. So I think this is the fairest way forward. Mr Robin Newton. Well, Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Minister for this uh, uh, piece of work and indeed for all the hard work that has gone in in the preparation of, of the uh, statement and indeed the initiatives that he's prepared to undertake. Could I just uh, seek uh, total clarity from the Minister? Um, Minister, you, 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 you'd uh, ask about, uh, you mentioned uh, within your statement about consultation and that your officials have been working extensively with CCEA and developing and that you'd engage with the education and training inspector, school leaders, teachers, and very importantly, uh, as you say in your words, very importantly, the young people uh, are pupils themselves to seek their way forward. Can I just clarify that the new assessments will be effectively at AS and A2 level be reduced by up to 60%? I'll be close to answer to some of this once. Yes, there's been extensive work that, is, that has gone on, and obviously because of the nature of this, it, it has had to go on in the background in relation to both the CCAA with ETI. But we've had worked with a group of school principals, of stakeholders drawn from a range of schools, again of a widely differing nature in terms of sectors, but also in terms of, for example, whether they're selective or non-selective, whether uh, they are a, uh, a school which goes to sort of a sixth form or not a sixth form. So there's a range of, of things. This has been teased out in a number of occasions and discussed uh, back and forward. And indeed also making sure that what is, what is doable, because there's no point in producing um, some idyllic solution which actually then couldn't be implemented on that basis. But also significantly last year, uh, sorry, last week, my officials met on a confidential basis within a number of schools to uh, to actually talk through with the sixth form what they saw as the, the options. And again, I think there was uh, a strong support for this type of uh, route that, that uh, could be taken in connection with that. The issue is, and I think this shouldn't be forgotten, that when we're talking about A, a levels and AS levels, we're putting, if you like, a minimum standard of a 40% floor, uh, which essentially means that provided in terms of the units which are selected by the schools, because some schools will take a different view over which units they would like to see assessed. Some will have had, as we appreciate as well, different levels of disruptions at different times of the, the year. So they will want to actually ensure that the units that they are taking uh, will be ones that, that relate most directly to their circumstances and their particular children. But that will lift the burden of up to 60% of the assessment um, from children at A levels and AS levels. Uh, there's a different arrangement as regards to GCSE where particular units have been taken out and taken out at say, the earlier stage. But again, there'll be considerable reduction there, and that runs alongside some of the other measures that are there, including the generosity of, of, of grading. Ms. Karen Mullen. Very last, Karen Collier. I thank the Minister for bringing the statement um, to, to the floor today to give students some assurity before Christmas. And Minister, I've heard you say before, nothing replaces that in-class from learning and following on from uh, the Chair's point. And, and your answer was that those students were working hard at home when we know that there's a very much a varied learning experience at home, particularly for those who have special education needs and need that in-classroom support. So for their students and the other students who have missed up to eight weeks um, and will continue to be disrupted, when, are they, when will you publish the full details of the special circumstances? 
I want to work with, with colleagues across jurisdictions in relation to that because my key desire, you make a very good point about where it will be an individual side of things. Now, I think the system-wide adaptations will go a long way to meeting that. So if a student is only expected and will know um, really from their school very early on which particular units they're being assessed on, they are effectively being assessed on 40% of the course, which removes more than half the course in terms of what the assessment will be, which means that even with considerable levels of, of time missed, there is that level of compensation. The reason I think why I think it's important that in terms of special circumstances we reach a point, if possible, where that, that is something that is universal across um, jurisdictions, is to try to create a situation where our students are not disadvantaged. And what I mean by that is that if we had, a, say for example, which is one option that is there, is some additional tariff or additional marks that we would put in place uh, for students who would missed a particular length of time. If we reach a point, for example, where our students uh, have, on the one hand, get a much higher tariff than anyone else, then there will be a suspicion at universities and other places that effectively a Northern Ireland or CCA degree uh, or qualification will be an easier degree than any or an easier exam than anywhere else. We've also got to take into account as well that in the comparability, we have about 20% of our students at A levels and AS levels who are doing boards that are outside Northern Ireland. I should make it very clear in terms of what can be delivered upon, and I appreciate it's probably been a, sometimes a bone of contention with myself and the Honourable Member for, for Upper Ban in relation to it, but where we are obviously at present, we want to make sure that the students are also treated equally between each other. On the flip side of the coin, if we were simply on a solo run to do special circumstances, which didn't go as far as was happening in, in other jurisdictions, we would have a situation where achieving particular grades would be harder in Northern Ireland than anywhere else. So that is why there needs to be a bit of work done that we can reach a common position, if at all possible, between different jurisdictions to try to make sure that, that special circumstances are reflected so that no one is disadvantaged when it comes to future employment or, for example, on a university place. And, and sometimes you'll get at different levels in university places. So we want to make sure that, that our students are given that level playing field. Mr Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for uh, the statement. Minister, in order for your department to engage in evidence-based policymaking in respect of these examinations and recognising the potential for differential adverse impact, it will be necessary and the view of the Children's Law Centre uh, for your department to screen the policy and carry out a full equality impact assessment of each available policy option, including proper consultation with affected young people and their families, educators, exam bodies and other affected stakeholders. Have you done this, Minister? And also, uh, a human rights impact assessment and a rural impact assessment should also have been conducted. Uh, have you done that also? All necessary procedures will have, will have been gone through, and we have done the level of consultation. But the member also needs to be aware, because there has been accusations that we have delayed this. We've, we've been trying to ensure that this has been, been got right. Now, you know, we could spend the next six months consulting on all these things, but that's not going to be a great deal of use of giving level of certainty to, to pupils. So we need to ensure that what we have is robust, one that there's a broader level of buy-in, and indeed we've gone, I think, with the adaptations that we have that would be that is a bit further than what England has gone, while ensuring that these are still acceptable to universities, and we've given a level of clarity which isn't there in other jurisdictions. Mr. Robbie Butler. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'd like to join the Minister in thanking our teachers for the hard work and wish them all a happy Christmas and, and yourself, Minister. There is some good news in this uh, announcement today with regard to A-levels, with regard to the 60% emission, which is something I've been pushing for. However, Minister, uh, for instance, I have a 15-year-old um, constituent who has missed 18 weeks of face-to-face -face teaching in Lagan Valley, and his father is at pains to understand how, he, uh, how his uh, lost learning will be mitigated. Given the fact that we have 60% emission at A-level, why can we not have 60% emission at GCSE level, where actually there is no equity across the subjects at GCSE well, level? The problem in terms of reduction on that, on that side of things is trying to get something as equitable. The position is regards to GCSEs, because there was a position that was declared earlier in terms of the, the unit emission, has meant that the same units were able to be admitted across the board. So everybody is entirely on a level playing field in relation to that. Um, that combined, and it should also be noted that in terms of trying to reach something as equitable this year, that while perhaps the focus at times has been in A levels and AS levels in terms of grading, that that grading, that generosity will be there in terms of grading will also take into account of that the 2020 standards for GCSEs as well. There will be, as I said, further work that will be on the individual uh, special circumstances. 
But we also need to make sure that there is a level of coverage of GCSEs also which enables pupils to be able to progress on to AS and A levels. So there's got to be a level of grounding that, that, is, that is there as well. And because uh, the position at an earlier stage then has been that in terms of GCSEs across the board on specific subjects, the particular areas of, of units admitted have already been worked on and schools have been working on those, the same level of choice would not be in a position. If we were to then at this stage, for instance, say we can take further units out of this, there would be some schools that in terms of, well, there was clear guidance given as much as possible for schools to try and do things in the same order. You would be omitting then potentially some units which schools maybe may well have, um, some schools may well have dealt with very extensively and others were uh, they, they wouldn't have, so it's, it's not quite the same position as regards to that. But again, we're talking about up to 40% omission on GCSEs as well. Mr. Morris Bradley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for making his statement to the House today. And, uh, Minister, uh, could you please clarify for me two points uh, in your statement? Is it correct to say that schools and school leaders can now choose themselves? which unit they wish to, their pupils to be examined on. And secondly, there are no algorithms or Z scores used to cal calculate a student's grade. It is all now based on the student's own performance. Is that the case? No, it is. I suppose in terms of the two points, yes. On the A levels and AS levels, it will be the schools making that level of choice. And in part, that will be because schools will have been in a position where they may have different levels of disruption. They may well have found that in doing a particular component of the course, that was a period in which for example, a large section of the school was, was off or a large section of that year was off. That allows them a level, level of choice. It allows them probably to concentrate on some of the things they've taught already. Because again, uh, the nature of things is that not every school will have taught things in the same order. So it will enable that level of flexibility to be, to be put into, into place. While still, as I said, there may be a very small number of students who want to do everything and there will be the opportunity for them to do that. Uh, on the issue of the, the calculations, yes, someone is sitting, for instance, one paper they will simply get the mark that they get and the grade that they get from that paper. It will not be adjusted by um, algorithms which seem to take on a certain level, which I suppose is a mathematical formula, but which, which seem to be externally put in place and created great concern. Or similarly, what is normally for missed units, Z scores, which again can adjust uh, where a pupil will be. The only adjustment will be made is if someone is doing, for instance, two papers and the two papers are weighted differently. So you may get a situation, for example, where to make up the 40%, two units may be used. One would normally be worth 20% and the second unit would be worth 30%. Well, obviously, in those circumstances, the 30% unit will count 50% more than the 20% unit, if you understand what I mean. It's a, a scaling up, if you like, but it's a scaling up purely of the marks that they get in the exam so that people can be assured that there will not be uh, an intervention from above because I think a lot of the problems and concerns were created because there was an expectation amongst pupils that they had got a particular grade and then found whenever whatever calculations we put in place, and this was particularly true, I think, of small cohorts, that they were then finding that they were getting a different grade, quite often a lower grade than what they anticipated. In some cases, it produced a higher grade, but it means that this would be purely alone on the merits of how the student performs within the, the examination themselves. Ms Nicola Brogan. Jeremy Ogots, Pri, Laskin Corla, and I thank the Minister for your statement today. Um, Minister, much of the speculation and media interest around today's statement has centred on GCSE and A level students. Um, but on behalf of the anxious BTEC students, can I ask what these new arrangements will mean for them in terms of their massive coursework burden they have had to shoulder despite months of disruption to their education? Specifically, I appreciate where there is probably a little bit of restriction in what can say. BTEC will always direct into the vocational qualification side of it, will lie under the control of the Department of the Economy. Uh, I suspect there will be a level of read across. We will be working with the, the economy, Department of Economy, but I suppose it's not my place to, to make an announcement on behalf of the, the economy minister, but clearly there will be um, implications. And I think across the board there has been work I think that has been ongoing in terms of how BTECs are reflected, not just here, but in other jurisdictions, to try to make sure that we have uh, a fair reflection of circumstances for BTEC students as well. Mr William Humphrey. Mr. Speaker, and I uh, join the minister in uh, thanking all of the staff in our, all our schools across Northern Ireland for all their work and dedication in this most difficult year. Minister, I welcome the engagement. It is hugely important. And uh, you did mention that no child in Northern Ireland should be disadvantaged across our United Kingdom. 
You also mentioned mitigations, re students who have had to uh, endure significant remote learning or indeed been ill, sadly, during COVID. Can I ask the Minister to confirm that he's currently looking at other scoping mitigations that would uh, ease the uh, already difficult circumstances that young people have found themselves throughout this pandemic and on top of those that are already in place from SIA? From that point of view, yes. As I said, in terms of special circumstances, I want to reach a situation where we have a, broadly speaking, a level playing field, if at all possible, across the UK uh, as regards that. I think in mitigations as well, we will need to give a good deal of thought. I think there are things which can be put in place which will facilitate students taking those examinations, which will protect their opportunities to do that. Those will all be, in, those will all be examined as well in terms of the individual measures that, that, that can be put in place. But this is about, I suppose, providing – today's uh, statement is largely about providing systems-wide mitigations, if I put it that way, for – and they go a long way also covering a lot of the individual circumstances, but there will be people who will fall, who will still be disadvantaged, and I think it's important that there is a level of protection that is put in place. There is still some further work to be done on that, so rather than give something which is very definitive and may end up being wrong in that regard, we want to work with colleagues across different jurisdictions, across different exam boards to put in place something ideally where special circumstances, and indeed in terms of I think, the idea, I think that is something which is accepted for instance, by the uh, Minister of Education at Westminster, that as much as possible, if we can reach a UK-wide uh, position as regards to special circumstances, that would be something which would be advantage to all pupils and make sure that, that no one is standing out. Um, because, as I said, depending upon what direction you go in, there is disadvantage in either direction if there isn't that level of parity across the board. Mr John O'Dowd. I would ask and cordially and thank the Minister for uh, his statement and answers thus far. Minister, this has been an awful year for students, um, particularly first year students in our further and higher education institutions. What consultation has the Minister had with the Minister for the Economy and our colleges and universities in relation to today's statement? And on another matter, Minister, if students are being assessed on 40 per cent of the course, is there a danger then that, teach that students are taught 40 per cent of the course? which then limits their horizons in terms of the next phase of their learning in colleges and universities. Well, the, the, the idea, and again, this is where there's no perfect system, there has been work ongoing, particularly with the universities, to make, try and make sure that whenever grades, that there's something that is acceptable in that regard, and that with, with all universities within that. And in terms of while there are certain decisions that will lie within the remit of the Minister for the Economy, I'll be working alongside her on those issues as well. Look, I, the, the member makes a, a valid point in terms of the level of assessment that potentially is, is there. Um, the aim would be to try to ensure that the full course then is taught. Will that, in some shape or form, create some level of, of skewering of the, the course? There is a degree of danger within that. And I think, to be fair, with all these, and there is some level of difficulty with any potential solution in that regard, I suspect it would mean that those that will be directly examined um, uh, those areas of the exam will have a probably a higher percentage level of concentration from the, the schools, and that becomes a certain level of natural consequence. But the aim is still to ensure that the full course uh, is covered, and we're trying to make the best of the very difficult. And I entirely acknowledge for everyone, but particularly for our students, this has been an incredibly difficult year. And while there is hope on the horizon, we're not out of the, the woods yet. Mr. Justin McNulty. I would like to thank the Minister for his statement um, and for his answers so far. Minister, there, are, there have been disproportionate adverse impacts on children's education as an outcome of this pandemic. The gap is widening. Children and young people from disadvantaged backgrounds and children with special educational needs are falling further behind. How are your proposals on exams addressing that and can you confirm that the algorithm fiasco of earlier this year will not be repeated? Well, I'm very happy to, um, uh, to confirm that. I mean, I think that as much as we can get fairness and objectivity within the system, and if somebody giving a subjective opinion or using a mathematical calculation which simply then adjusts according to how a school does compared to another school, which I think is one of the problems that would be there with um, even sort of moderation in terms of CAGs in that regard. But I can give the member an absolute assurance in terms of the algorithm the, the algorithm, well, I'm not altogether sure that, that many people and many of us would be experts in algorithms in that regard. There's no algorithm, there's no which would normally apply Z scores being applied 
within this year uh, as well. So it would be purely on the basis of, of what the student um, achieves directly on their own merits and their own marks within that, against the backdrop in which there is a generosity uh, within that. I think that, that in terms of levels of um, – he's right in terms of the issues about uh, differential disruption in that regard. I think by ensuring that there is a considerably level of reduced content, that goes a long way to meeting a lot of those measures. But again, as I said, I want to explore, hopefully on a cross-jurisdictional basis, how we can apply special circumstances for individual students. And I would also indicate that that will be in addition to the current – as the member, I'm sure, is aware – there are already mechanisms in place which apply that if someone in a, call it a normal year has some set of special circumstances through illness or whatever where there's provision can be made. So anything that we're doing this year will be on top of that. So if someone is, for instance, ill for another reason, but we need to actually see how we can adapt that particularly for this, uh, the particulars for those who have missed out because of COVID. Mrs. Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, so far for your answers. Minister, you spoke previously this morning about, this, about not having our students disadvantaged if they wanted perhaps to go to universities in England, Scotland, Wales, etc. Now, as you'll be aware, we have still quite a few students here in Northern Ireland that like to study in Trinity in Dublin. Have you had any talks or discussions with the universities down there and what would be acceptable? Look, I, I think um, I'll have to get some detail back just in terms of I mean, at the moment, while things are a little bit unclear in the Republic of Ireland, the suggestion is that they will be doing all of the leaving cert and certainly would intend to be by way of, of examinations. We believe that, that a system which is broadly speaking acceptable to universities should be therefore acceptable across the board um, in relation to that, but there will be further engagement as we move ahead, uh, particularly with our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland. I should be uh, at a on Friday. Um, uh, unfortunately, we're still by Zoom, but there's a North-South Ministerial Council meeting um, on Friday, so I may be in a position directly to raise that with my opposite number, uh, Norma Foley. Unfortunately, it's not in the beautiful city uh, of Armagh. Uh, this is just to make sure that Mr McNulty is paying attention in that regard. Um, we'll be doing it by Zoom, uh, but it will still allow that, enable that level of engagement to take place. Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, and thank you very much, Minister. And I'll declare an interest as the mother of a, a young person who's going through their A2s very shortly. You must fail for me. Um, Minister, you have mentioned about the code of, uh, or COVID allowance or tariff. Can I just ask when that will be published? And will it, for instance, specify things like how many missed school days will be necessary for a pupil to to receive the COVID grade tariff. Young people need confidence now, and I think if we can publish specifications like that, it will help them. I understand that. Um, the position, though, is, and I think that's one of a number of options that are there. It's probably the most likely option. The point I, I'm making in terms of any level of tariff is we want to make sure that it's something that, if at all possible, that is universal uh, across, because that also, on the basis of said, mentions, uh, and I, I sympathise with the, the position of, of being the mother of an A2 uh, student, but both at A2 and A level, there will be about 20% of our cohort will do this from um, boards that are outside Northern Ireland. So we want to make sure that, that everybody is treated fairly. And the point I made that if, for example, we end up with a situation in which there is a COVID tariff, if that is the route uh, to which special circumstances go down and we'll need to work with other jurisdictions, I don't want a situation where either, as I said, our results are then viewed with suspicion by um, employers or universities because they have a more generous tariff than elsewhere, or alternatively, which I'm sure would be a grave concern to people, that if we were reached a system in which there was a, a, a tariff which then played at a much lower level to other jurisdictions, that we would actually then be disadvantaging our pupils in terms of, in terms of good. So I think there's work to be done between boards, with Ofqual, uh, and indeed between the jurisdictions to try as much as possible, it may or may not be 100 per cent possible, but as much as possible to reach a, a common position across different jurisdictions. Mr. Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Given the, um, what the Minister said about the need to introduce special circumstances and the fact that SIA will be responsible for dealing with a vast and, I'm afraid, what will inevitably be a chaotic process of appeals, first of all, is he confident that SIA has the resources to deal with this unprecedented 
and Byzantine process, which is going to be inflicted on them and the young people of Northern Ireland. And secondly, uh, Minister, can you confirm that the um, the upshot of your statement is that if Gavin Williamson, the widely thought to be incompetent and chaotic Secretary of State in England, has to perform a U-turn on exams proceeding in England, then here in Northern Ireland we will simply follow what he's done. From that point of view, I always want to make sure, above all else, that our students are not disadvantaged. So obviously we will have to look at times at what happens in other jurisdictions. And we cannot, if you like, if Northern Ireland is an outrider. But it's been made very clear the position in England uh, as to where they are with examinations. And indeed, particularly as regards a, some examinations in November went ahead without, at a time whenever they, we anticipate the, the, uh, the pandemic would, at a greater level, it will be at uh, next summer, went ahead very successfully in, in connection with that. Uh, I, you know, I should say almost as, from a historical point of view, while uh, something being accused of being Byzantine is obviously a, a form of insult in, in, in that regard, it was a very successful uh, uh, empire for many, many centuries prior to its collapse in that, in that regard. Uh, and I know, uh, I know sort of that, that as a member of the DUP, sometimes we're accused of harping back to the 17th century, but uh, there, may be more, there may be more classical civilizations that, that uh, we could look at uh, within that, that as well. Mr. Jerry Carroll. Mr. ended a statement by saying, uh, fairness to pupils is my top priority. He also stated that over testing pupils is not healthy. Uh, can the Minister explain how it is fair or indeed healthy that post primary exams will go ahead in the new year despite pupils being in the middle of a health pandemic, many thousands miss, missing so much of the time off school and uh, teaching, not to mention serious concerns that exist around children's safety that his department still has not addressed? Order. Second time today, post primary transfer was not in the statement issued by the Minister, and I have to remind members that. Um, statements should, or questions should relate to the statement. The Minister is at liberty to answer that question if he wishes to, but he does not have to. Okay, well, look, the, the broader level on any examinations will always take place against public health guidelines. We will make sure that is the case. And it is the point that is most directly as regards post prime you know, it is not really as, as De Principal Deputy Speaker the subject of today's um, debate in relation to this. But from a health point of view particularly, if we're talking about in each day roughly 300,000 pupils being in, to be able to accommodate 10,000 on a particular day doesn't seem beyond the bounds of possibility. I, I want to make sure that, that in terms of all our examinations, they are as fair as possible, that there is. We've taken, I think, a very far-reaching decisions today in relation to reduction in course content, in, in relation to where grades are, which create a unique circumstance, which put, for instance, um, it will mean that those pupils in 2021 will be in a very different position from those in 2019 on that basis. And I think that is where that level of accommodation has got to be, has got to be, um, has also got to be reflected as, as well. But again, I, sort of, I thank the member for his good wishes. Mrs. Clare Sugden. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Can we assume, given the process that you have now outlined, that students may perform better than would have been expected? And how will this then affect um, admissions to FE and HE, particularly for competitive courses? And also, does it open up options for students who maybe didn't think they would perform as well to maybe apply to different cor uh, courses? And I ask this in the, in, the amidst, in the midst of an admissions process uh, going towards university. And lastly, how are we supporting teachers? Um, this seems quite chaotic, and I understand that this will be new to them perhaps today. So so how are we going to support teachers through the next six months? Um, on a number of the points, it, yes, it, it may mean that, that because there's been a shift in, in uh, where the boundaries are, it, what it does mean is that I think that those who are in sitting exams in 2021 will be put in a very similar position, at least in terms of eventual outcomes, as 2020. Uh, and in some cases, there will be for some university places, for FE places, there will be some, for instance, who will have not taken up those in 2020, and it will mean then. Uh, either by way of deferred entry or indeed people who simply felt I don't want to apply at this stage because uh, I am not getting the full university experience, for example. Uh, what it will mean is that, that the, those who are graduating, if I can put it that way, in 2021 and those graduating in 2020 will, will be on a level playing field uh, with, each, with each other. She mentions particularly the, um, uh, the issue of um, uh, of teachers. I, I think one of the advantages of this, in terms of where teachers, they will see a reduced burden because of the assessment uh, change of it. 
the problem is specifically as regards, and I, look, I appreciate that with every subject there will be a range of opinions that will be there. But for teachers, because they are not then doing a central assessment of their individual pupils, that I think will relieve a level of the pressure on them to be able to say, not simply what I believe the student would get, but also rank them, and will feel, no matter how much there is a level of confidentiality with that, there, there's always going to be a concern, I think, from some teachers looking over their shoulder of, if I don't give some suddenly this, you know, will there be any level of comeback on me? So I think this does actually relieve the burden. It is also because the choice is then going to be at a school level. It gives that, that opportunity, rather than some, having something as much as possible imposed upon schools, there were other options which, which involved, if you like, simply uh, a, an overall high level of reduction, but it's simply being pushed from SIA at, at, at this stage. And I think particularly as where we are in the school year, that, would have, that wouldn't have given schools that level of flexibility uh, within that. No other member has indicated to me. And that concludes questions on this statement by the Minister for Education. The next item of business will be a statement from the Minister on the terms of reference for the independent review of education. If I could ask the House to take its ease for a few moments while there is a change at the top table. Thank you.